Okay, so now with that being said, let's go to a new concept that I want to teach. So I want to give you sort of an introduction to Wall Street, and this is only two slides, so it's not gonna be in too in depth, but I think a lot of people are not familiar with this. So we're gonna sort of define Wall Street in a picture uh, style, and this may not be a complete, complete uh, uh, diagram of Wall Street, but I think it's pretty good. And we're going to segment Wall Street into two parts, the buy side, or we'll just call them investors. And then the other side is the sell side, or a better word for it is just saying investment banks. I think the whole buy side, sell side names are a little silly. I just like to say these are investors and these are investment banks. Investment banks service the investors. They're basically service providers. Um, so in any event, there's a few different kinds of investors, and we went over this a little bit. Mutual funds like Fidelity, Wellington, State Street, Putnam, Capital Research. And then there's hedge funds like Renaissance, Oxif, Citadel, Millennium, Oak Tree, and Paulson. But these aren't the only two kinds of investors. There's plenty of other people. In fact, I should add individuals, the most important thing of all. So pension funds, insurance companies, corporate America, sovereign wealth, individuals, all of these folks in aggregate manage just as much, if not more, than the mutual funds who manage quite a bit more than the hedge funds. The investment bank side is a little bit different. So you've got investment banking, which is where most of the money is made. Most of the money is made. And these are investment banks. These are Here's a partial list of investment banks. Bank of America, Citigroup, Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, RBC, and Wells Fargo. Those are a few investment banks. And what they do is they'll lend to companies, they'll arrange lending, and that involves often underwriting, which is the process of selling a security to the public or to investors. So they sell your company security, let's say your IBM, you wanna sell $6 billion of debt, well, you would have to hire one of these banks to do that. You couldn't just go out there and say, oh, I'm just gonna sell it myself. It doesn't work that way. You need a bank, a bank that has relationships with all of these investors. You might wanna buy another company, so do you need m and advice? Um, and that is useful. So investment banking is a, is a pretty big part of these companies, these investment banks' profits. The other thing that they do that is profitable is they um, do different services for these investors. So they'll actually conduct trades or they'll prime brokerage or broker their money or deposit their money for them and clear their trades and things like that. And finally, these banks issue securities research. They give buy and sell recommendations on securities. And these are generally not considered or thought through too heavily. Every now and then, one out of 100 maybe of these sell-side securities analysts will be useful, but in general, they're pretty biased due to the conflict of interest that exists with investment banking, despite the rules that exist to separate those two, despite that. In any event, one of the things I wanted to say, one of the things that took a long time for me to learn and was very painful for me to learn, is that when it comes to stock market recommendations, they're never worth listening to. They're always worth ignoring, no matter who, no matter who they come from, including Warren Buffett or Carl Icahn. I think stock recommendations are worthless uh, in many ways. Now, they're not completely worthless. Obviously, there can be good stock picks from people, but I think that you should spend your time more efficiently researching yourself. I would not look, the first thing I would definitely would not look at is investment bank opinions. Then I certainly wouldn't look at other investors' opinions or their holdings. You can look up an investment funds funds holdings I, I would I would worry about learning securities by yourself and learning lateral skills I would definitely not spend my time looking at other people's opinions it's not that they're completely worthless it's that you want to win at the game of your own time you want to bet on yourself and short everyone else and the long short game of your time is the most valuable thing you have and listening to other people and thinking about other people's stock picks is not going to get you very far, in my humble opinion. And I used to think carefully about the markets uh, and their other people's investments, and, and I certainly didn't do very well when I did that, and I started to do much better when I thought for myself. So in any event, that's sort of what I'm thinking about there. Lateral skills are things like, well, if you're looking at, like, for example, what I did, I was a pharmaceutical investor, investor. So instead of spending my time worried about what other pharmaceutical investors were doing, I learned a lateral skill of pharmacology. I studied deeply in fields like pharmacology and medicinal chemistry and, and you know, other areas, just general preclinical science. And these were important to me. It helped me be a better pharma investor. When it came time to be an entrepreneur, I, these skills came in handy. These, these skills came in handy. 
So it, it, was, uh, it was much better for me to spend my time doing this than it was to worry about 13F filings or being on the phone all day talking to other investors, watching CNBC. All of this was, a, was not, you're, you're not, not completely useless. But relative to what I could spend my time on, remember, I only have 24 hours in a day, so all of this was comparatively useless. This was useful stuff. This was stuff that people didn't know, that people couldn't match with the skill of investing. This is just garbage compared, comparatively. Now, I know there's plenty of people that do this who are quite successful, but this is just my tips for success. So in any event, um, those, that's a, it only took 10 minutes, but I think there's a lot of information crammed in there. And so one of the things that we're going to do, um, you know, we've been looking at the technology industry for a little bit, and one of the things we're going to do is try to fixate on one subsector. And by the end of today, by the end of today, we're going to pick one, and we're going to pick one by vote. We're not going to pick one based on my own opinion. We're going to pick one by, by your guys' opinion. But before we do that, we're going to go run through a couple more tech companies. And one of the big big subsectors we have to look at, of course, is telecom. It's up to us. We're going to pick one subsector. Tech is so large, it's kind of hard to look at all of it. In fact, I know companies that have 20 or 30 investment analysts that uh, want to cover the technology industry. And that, that takes a lot, of, a lot of firepower. So for us, we're going to actually just stick to one of these subsectors. I don't know if it's going to be software or semiconductors or hardware or internet or what. But we're going to pick one at some point. So in any event, let's let's kind of continue along our path because I think we learn a lot as we successively look at more and more companies. So Alibaba is one such company, and Alibaba um, does not file 10 Qs and 10 Ks. And this is interesting. The reason they don't do that is because this is a company that is based, as you can see, they are not based in the U.S. They are based somewhere else. I think they're maybe based in China, for instance. Let's take a look. I don't know, I can't tell by reading this. Hong Kong, there it is, Hong Kong. I actually like to tra keep track of headquarters, believe it or not. Headquarters, Hong Kong. All right, so Alibaba. I don't know anything about this company. I don't know anything about this company. Let's take a look. Here it is, December quarter 2015 results. Alibaba today announced the results. Alibaba had an outstanding quarter, reaching a milestone of over 400 million annual active buyers. And continue our unrivaled leadership in mobile. Our proven ability to deliver an unparalleled consumer experience helps merchants attract buyers will drive future growth in our core business. Sounds like an e-commerce company, doesn't it? Said Daniel Zhang, Chief Executive Officer of Alibaba. We remain focused on our top strategic priorities, including global imports, rural expansion, increasing our footprint in first-tier Chinese cities, and building world-class cloud computing business. Okay, really sounds like Amazon, huh? We had excellent results. We achieved impressive revenue growth and we were increasingly monetizing the user activity in our marketplaces, particularly mobile devices. In this quarter, revenue grew 32% year over year, and China retail marketplace revenue grew 35% year over year, said the CFO, Maggie Wu. Meanwhile, we generated strong fee cash, free cash flow of $4 billion this quarter. Okay, well, if you generate $4 billion a quarter, that means you're going to generate $16 billion a year, right? And I know this is a $180 billion market cap. 